Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello and welcome to our February edition of Word of Mouth. My name is Michael Horn. I'm your host of this podcast, Word of Mouth, coming to you through the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Just a reminder to all our listeners before we introduce our wonderful, wonderful guest this month, that if you don't want to miss an episode of the Word of Mouth podcast, make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or any other podcast app. Just search for the Archdiocese of St. Louis to find us. And once you've subscribed, make sure to rate us and then share us with your friends when you have time. So thank you so much for tuning in today. I am with Bobby Hoffman, who is our esteemed February guest. Bobby, how are you doing? Hey, Michael. Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. My pleasure. My pleasure. So we'll just go right into it here. We typically introduce our guests, and just can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background, your interests, things like that? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me again, Michael. Bobby Hoffman, grew up in St. Charles. I'm a proud Missourian my whole life, the youngest of four children from two great parents. My mom is actually a regular listener, so hi, Mom. I love you. John and Mary are my parents, and then uh, the youngest of four children, so my three siblings, Molly, Brittany, and Jimmy. And then me, four, four and five years. My sister Molly is five years and a day older than me, so my parents are both saints. Grew up in St. Charles. St. Joseph's in Cottleville was our parish. Very active in the parish, really strong community there, very grateful. Had a really good neighborhood, good growing up out in St. Charles. The classic St. Louis question, where did I go to high school? I went to Chaminade College Preparatory High School, played football, golf, track, student government, you know, the whole thing. Really, really good experience at Chaminade. Before I went to the University of Missouri, where I got my bachelor's and master's in accounting. Go Tigers. Hoping for an exciting run here in March with the basketball team. High school, great experience. I know I shared with you earlier, Michael, really involved with the Life Teen program through both St. Joseph's and Cottleville and through Incarnate Word, where I'm actually still a core member now. Um, really, really good experiences there. Currently, I live in Brentwood. Moved back here about three years ago now after college. Very involved with my parish at Incarnate Word. Work in the family business with my dad and my brother. Yeah, excited to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I'm just going to let our listeners know real quick. If anyone ever says I'm intolerant, that is just false because I am a proud Vianney graduate and I'm hosting a <laughs> Chaminade graduate before me. Hey, and I'm also, Marianus. this is going to make some Missourians cringe, but I am a KU fan standing in the midst of a Mizzou Tiger. Ooh. So this is just holy brotherhood right here. Honored this is just that you'd unconditional me, love. So, Very yeah. honored you'd have me. <laughs> So, Bobby, thanks for letting us know a little bit about your background and such. I just like to to delve a little bit more deeply into kind of your work with Life Teen. And you mentioned to me earlier about being a Cove Crest missionary. Could you talk a little bit about that? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, Life Teen has played a pretty big, a huge role in my life. I would say was a teen with St. Joseph's Cottleville. Uh, actually, before we had Life Teen, so just my freshman year, um, it was being run by Father Chris Martin. And then about halfway through my freshman year, they brought in Life Teen. So we brought in the program, hired a youth minister, got to see kind of the way it really brought the parish to life. Uh, really, really beautiful. And then was teen my senior year, so went to a different youth group my senior year at Incarnate Word. And then through that, I got to go down to Cove Crest. Cove Crest is Life Teen's summer camp my senior year in high school. And then went back there the summer after my freshman year in college as a summer missionary. Think camp counselor, mm-hmm. but we, the term is summer missionary. It's much more evangelization-based, so actually very appropriate for the podcast. But spent six weeks down there working with high schoolers and middle schoolers. Had a really, really, really amazing experience. And then, as I mentioned earlier, now currently still on core, mm-hmm. core member at Life Dean at Incarnate Word. Excellent. And finally, just what are some of your interests, Bobby, things you like to do? Nowadays... Spend a lot of time working. No, I play golf. I like to hike a lot. Just went skiing with my buddies a couple weeks ago. Play volleyball. And then my family's got a really great lake house out in New Melly. Uh, Sweet. Called Lake Sherwood. So go out there about as frequently as I can, too. Great. That's a little bit about your background. And if you could talk to us a little bit more about your personal faith journey and how you've kind of encountered our Lord along the road of your life so far and some big turning points in your life. Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking. You know, it's funny. It reminds me of... 
when I was in college, uh, when I was at Mizzou, I was, you know, fairly involved in different ministries, fairly involved with the Newman Center. But my junior year, I got to go on a mission trip to Jamaica. And it was actually through the non-denominational church in Columbia. And what our non-denominational brothers and sisters do a very good job of is asking this question. Hey, what's your story? What's your testimony? Kind of how have you encountered Christ? And while I was on that trip, I was honored, kind of as the token Catholic, to be asked to give my testimony to the other 60 students who were down there with me. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And, you know, I was really excited. And the way I summed it up then and the way I would sum it up now is my story is one of really, really big prayers and God being really faithful to those prayers. So often we all, especially as Catholics, pray these like really enormous, exciting prayers that we have no idea where they're going to go. You know, even just prayers like the Our Father, like asking mm-hmm. that the Lord would keep us faithful to him all the time, keeping us out of temptation. Prayers that I have prayed, prayers that people have prayed on my behalf for me to be faithful, for me to be serving, to be a true son of the Lord. And God just being incredibly faithful to those. You know, faith journey. I grew up in a good Catholic household. We'd go to Mass every Sunday. It was common for us to pray in the house. I was, you know, catechized through St. Joseph's Cottleville, got my sacraments through St. Joe, you know, involved with retreats and life teen and things through high school. I remember one moment my freshman year in high school, I went on the pro-life march through Generation Life. So I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm a freshman in high school. It's January, so I'm probably, what, 13, 14 years Mm -hmm. old. And my brother was there. My brother's a junior. He's two years ahead of me. We're about to go into a major session of praise, worship, and adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. And my brother looked at me and goes, hey, this might look kind of weird, but just go with it. And I'll, like, never forget that (laughs) moment because I did. I just, like, went for it. And I was like, okay. Like, my trustworthy brother, my best friend was like, hey, this is going to look a little bit weird, but go with it. And I was like, okay. I mean, I'd experienced adoration before, but for some reason in that moment, like, being given permission to, like, go with it, to pray, to, like, really go for it with Christ was really amazing. It's a moment that really stands out for me. Kind of kicked off high school, really kind of making my faith my own in high school for, like, the first time, you know, choosing to go to Mass, choosing to go to Life Dean, choosing to pray when I didn't have to, when my parents weren't making me. Same story in college, you know, with that question of, like, what's your testimony? So often there's these really big dramatic moments of, like, oh, well, I turned away and this happened, and then I was at Chick-fil-A one day eating my chicken McNugget, and I heard Chris Tomlin, how great is our God? And I remember that God was there in that moment. Like I never had any like big transformative Mm -hmm. moments like that. But I remember in college, again, having the choice, do I want to make this part of my life? Do I want to continue to pray? Do I want to continue to go to mass? Do I want to stay close to the sacraments, stay close to the church? And choosing it, like really, really choosing it for the first time that like my parents weren't there. Like my community of people through Life Team, through church, through the school, weren't there. And I chose it again that moment. Again, just God being incredibly faithful to these big prayers that had been prayed and choosing to continue to draw me near to him. Again, other big transition times right after college, moving back home, having this like really beautiful existential crisis that everybody goes through when you're like no longer a student for the first time and trying to figure out, you know, is this faith thing real? Is this God thing going to continue to matter to me? You know, a lot of our peers, Michael, leaving the church. A lot of, you know, people are constantly Mm -hmm. talking about young adults, how to keep that dynamic, how to keep that group in the church. But at this point, my life, just like your life, I'm sure you'd say, this is the only thing that I have, right? Like my faith is my rock. It's my Mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. God is just being incredibly faithful and continuing to draw me to him. That's beautiful. I love the comment you mentioned about big prayers and just sometimes not even knowing that we're praying for something great. Exactly. Exactly. Or that other people are praying for something great for us. And so just like you said, a simple prayer like the Our Father, which is the best prayer that we can pray, which is, of course, in the context of the Mass, just that prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, sometimes is just we don't really know what be that careful. means. Yeah. Exactly. And so God does have great plans for us, and sometimes that prayer is scary, like you said. So that's a very interesting point for our consideration and reflection. The next question, Bobby, is based on your mission and vocation. So what would you say is – your mission, your vocation, some dreams that you have in this life? Big questions. Okay. No, I love it. Mission, vocation, purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, whenever I th- hear words like that, I, I think of first and foremost that universal call to holiness, right? That every single one of us, every single one of us is called to be saints, that every single one of us is called to heaven, that we're all beloved sons and daughters of God, and we're all called to be holy, you know, our, our purpose is to just to love people well, mm-hmm. to love people well and to show them to Christ, to show Christ to them. 
called to love and serve. You know, I once read, how did it go? It said, to be Catholic is to pantingly pursue all that makes us most fully alive and fully ourselves. I love it. And I love that. I've, I've always remembered that, to pantingly pursue all that makes us most fully alive and fully ourselves. In some ways, I mean, I think this isn't me dodging the question, but isn't that all of our calling? Mm-hmm. Awesome. So this everybody has seems to have a different definition. There's a lot of similarities here on this final introductory question that we have, but how would you, Bobby, define evangelization? It's a great question. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of shows, and mm-hmm. one that I really love is Bishop Robert Barron. And mm-hmm. Bishop Robert Barron is very fond of saying, I don't think he came up with it. He might have stolen it from Chesterton or somebody else, that evangelization, evangelization is just one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. It's just one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. And I really, really love that. Evangelization is, it's inviting. It's sharing your joy. It's the willingness to be vulnerable. I learned a really great lesson. You mentioned Cove Crest earlier. Mm -hmm. When I was a summer missionary at Cove Crest, I said think camp counselor, but think far beyond it, right? Because it really is focused on this question of evangelization, that when we're at summer camp, we're there to show the teens, the high schoolers, the middle schoolers that we're serving Christ. And I remember probably my second week of summer camp, it was a Wednesday, so I'm about halfway through the second week, and I remember just asking myself that question, am I doing that? Am I doing that? Because this is the whole reason I'm here. Am I doing it? And at first, like, really struggling with it because there was a lot of people who could tell great stories about, oh, I had this moment with this teen, and we prayed together, and we cried, and we hugged, and it was beautiful. And I kept asking myself, am I doing that? And sparing all the glory details, but I remember spending time in the chapel and asking myself, who are the 10 people who have led me closest to Christ? Who are the 10 people who have evangelized me the best? And as I thought of those people, basically the Lord's bringing me through prayer to say, well, what about those people made me think of them when I think of the 10 people who have evangelized me the best? And every single one of them to the last were people who were living these full, holy, glorious, authentic lives. And then me just watching it and saying, what is it that they have? What is it that they do? And how can I incorporate that into my life? Like, what is it that Michael's doing? Why is he so happy? Why is he so joyful? Why is he so full? Why is he so whole? How can I incorporate that into my own life? And so when I saw people doing that, I realized that if that's what speaks to my heart, I'm probably not the only one. And so that should be the way I evangelize, is by living a full, holy, glorious, joyful life. Mm -hmm. And having people ask why, just like I did. And then, of course, as always, having a reason for your joy, right? Being able to explain, just like the epistle of Peter, right? Mm -hmm. Being ready to explain when people ask the reason for your joy. Mm -hmm. I love that, Bobby. And I think that you just touched on, again, following up with the big prayers idea, just that we're not called to a mediocre existence, that we're called to greatness. And like John 10, 10, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full, have abundance of life, and that we're not here to just live this kind of mediocre life, like I said. And a lot of the focused missionaries that I talk about, and it's really important idea in their work that they say so many people live these lives of quiet desperation. Mm. And so there's this contentment with just being average or not having like a ton of problems. But they, you can tell that they're longing for something and that they want something more, but they're just kind of content or scared to voice that they are longing for something more. And so I think that's really important for us to remember that Christ has plans for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, like the huge passage, like know well the plans that I have for you, plans for your well-being, prosperity. And so just to think of that, that greatness is in store. We can seek it out and pursue it. So awesome. Well, then based on your story and the emphasis that you placed on kind of relationships and looking at people, how they've influenced you in your own life and then ministering to other people as a missionary and such, just the power of community is there. And so we covered this for a catechesis in another segment. I think it was the second podcast that we did back with Charlie Harris, uh, another Chaminade graduate. Yeah, he... Yeah, so he also talked about the role of community, and and I kind of provided a catechesis on it, but we're going to take a little bit different spin on it this time. It'll be more of a touch with not so much rooted right in the gospel and the Acts of the Apostles like we did the first time, but this will be more just general outreach for community today and what we've learned through just kind of anthropological studies and sociology and things like that and just looking at community in general. And obviously there will be that stance of incorporating the role of 
Christianity in it, but it'll just be more from like a human standpoint as well. So, so a lot of the excerpts that I'll take for this catechesis are from this wonderful writer named Chris Hazel, who's the founder of the Call Collective, which is a blog that explores the intersection between faith, culture, and creativity. And so we'll have a lot of insights to reflect on here in our catechesis on community. So Hazel writes that there seems to be an underlying need for us as human beings to be grafted onto something other than our own selves. And so in a culture today that we find ourselves in, where many places are just really filled with a spirit of autonomy and self-centeredness, we're caught in this tension of enjoying unlimited freedom. We want what we want and we want it now. And so he talks about this tension here of enjoying unlimited freedom while still identifying yet as part of a larger whole. And so we all belong to one human family. Many of us today spend time with others, though, just enough to avoid feeling completely separated from them, but not enough to be adequately known by them. And so sometimes we hide ourselves and we don't fully enter into being known by another person. So that's our challenge. So there's a lot of studies that show that many Americans today live on their own. But the question is for us to ponder is, Do people live alone because they want to or because they have to? And so being alone can provide us with a sense of restorative solitude, which is exactly what we need sometimes to reconnect with others. So to recharge and to connect with God and to have that alone time and prayerful solitude in order to then effectively build community. However, the problem is that many people who live alone are insecure. They're very proud of their freedoms but still hungry for contact. Sometimes they're anxious, smug, or occasionally scared of being lonely in the sense that they are. And they experience a mixture of emotions that many of us, even those who do not live alone, can certainly recognize. We all know people in our lives who live physically alone but are still connected to other people in many ways, living happy, fulfilling, and healthy lives. So we see that as well. On the other hand, we also know those people who are married or in constant contact with other people who are still not connected. They're drifting further and further into a hidden solitary confinement. And so that's important for us. So a lot of people say that they're lonely when they're alone, but that's not necessarily the case. And so it's for us to consider just what is a healthy understanding of being alone for prayer, for solitude, for that time to restore ourselves versus being amidst people constantly and yet still not fostering a full sense of community. Like I mentioned earlier with this idea of truly being known and letting ourselves be known by another and others. So all aspects of our life emotional, spiritual, physical aspects. They call us into deep relationships so that we can be healthy human beings. We can merely skim the surface of Scripture to uncover the loaded truth that man should not be alone in the book of Genesis. We find it as early as the first book that we read in the Bible. So even during Christ's three years of public ministry, too, in the New Testament, he surrounded himself with his disciples. He made sure to find a space for solitude to pray to the Father each day. But many of his waking hours, when he wasn't preaching or healing or working miracles, were spent in the company of 12 men, his friends. So we constantly see Christ in the Gospels out and about with people But there's certainly a sense of solitude as well as he goes out in the early hours of the morning to pray and to be alone, to commune with his Father. And so that's important for us to think about, just that healthy balance between solitude and effective community. So letting ourselves be known in that community and also knowing others, coming to a greater understanding of those that we hang around. So Jesus walked with his disciples. He ate with them. He lived with them. He was God. Yet they aided and nourished his natural development in his human nature, just like food, water, sleep, and other natural things do for us. So God, in becoming a man, allowed himself to be nourished by human relationships, by community. So that brings us to a good question. What exactly do we mean today when we use the word community? It's a common word, but what type of community actually breeds life within us and encourages us on our journey back to God? In the spiritual life, We can't just have friends, people with common interests who don't necessarily draw us closer to our authentic selves and God. Such relationships can be a gift, an oasis of refreshment, but we have to be really aware of these types of relationships and how they're not full. And so the type of relationships or community that can feed us most effectively and deeply are those ones that lure us closer to God. These relationships are wonderful. And the friends that we develop in these relationships are friends who aren't afraid to challenge us, to admonish us, to lift us up, and to show us 
who we truly are. They show us our faults and also our strengths for the sake of helping us to overcome our weaknesses through God's grace. So these are the relationships that really can help us, but make us uncomfortable at times, but for our betterment. And so I encourage you just to think about those relationships in your life that you currently have and how you can better foster a sense of community with those people who really give you the honest truth, not in a way that tears you down, but just in a way that's honest and shows you the beauty that is within you, the greatness, like Bobby was talking about, the greatness that we all have and are called to by our Lord. So true community then embodies the the type of relationships that ask us to give up some of our aloneness and sense of autonomy. Community invites us to go deeper into the messy life of human relationships that won't always make us feel good all the time. It shatters the ego-crafted mirage that we often find ourselves in and help us to realize the value of community and who we truly are as seen through the eyes of another. So accountability today in our lives is vital. In isolation, slowly we begin to lose a sense of who we truly are. So we must go beyond our own self and reach out to others and let others reach out to us. It requires a sacrifice, a vulnerability that often isn't easy to shed no matter how many times we do it. But it's these types of relationships, the ones that ask us to sacrifice our ego, our time, our comfort, and this sense of false freedom that really produce fertile ground for healthy community. And through this community that we establish, we are able to draw others from their aloneness into the union that we celebrate as divine life. And so through this authentic sense of community, this genuine relationship that we can develop with other people, whether it's on a one-on-one level or a small group level or even a large group level, it really invites us into the fullness of who we are as Christians. So this is a blessing for our lives. So I just invite you to take some time to pray about community in your own life and what it truly means and how it can improve in your life. And so finally, we're going to wrap up our session today for February with Bobby's thoughts on some closing practical advice to be a good evangelist. So Bobby, if we're looking for somebody just tuned into the show right now and they want to take three things away, how to be a good evangelist, what would you tell them? First of all, Michael, that was beautiful. That was really, really beautiful reflection on community. And I think, you know, the first tip would actually go very well with that. Be in communion, right? Like evangelization is a contact sport. It is a relationship (laughs) sport. And we have to be in communion we have to be able to know each other. We have to be in a relationship in order for me to show you Christ, right? Mm-hmm. In order for you to see Christ in me, you have to know me well. And so being in relationship, there is, you touched it, you hit it so well. There's such a temptation for isolation today. Mm-hmm. I think it's so much worse now too. At least I, as I've grown up, I've seen it more and more, how easy it is to be isolated, um, what a temptation it is. But evangelization always starts with relationship. So first You know, my first recommendation, piece of practical advice would be be in communion, be in relationship, make yourself vulnerable, and the Lord will use that. Mm -hmm. Second piece of advice, I would say, you know, evangelize naturally. Evangelize naturally. It can be so easy to see what other people do, see Michael and his podcast and say, oh, I need to start a podcast then. But maybe that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, see where, see where your joy lies, see where uh, you feel full, see where you feel most yourself, because that's the Lord working through you. See where there's peace. That's the Lord working through you. And be there. Be fully there. And and be joyful there. And be in relationship there. And let people see that. So don't go try to evangelize like somebody else does. Don't see, oh, well, I read this in a book. I heard this on TV. I saw this on a podcast. See where your life is. See where your joy is. And evangelize there. That'd be the second thing, evangelize naturally. And then the third thing, just never underestimate the power of an invitation. Never underestimate the power of an invitation. It doesn't matter what it's to, whether it's to church or a prayer group or, or, a, or a dinner or whatever it is. Nobody gets upset when they're invited somebody somewhere, right? Nobody's ever disappointed. Oh, Michael, I wish you hadn't asked me to do that, right? Like people love being invited. People love being included. And, and never underestimate the power of that and how the Lord can work through those invitations. So first, you know, be in communion. Second, evangelize naturally. And then third point, uh, never underestimate the power of an invitation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bobby. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your perspective on things. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your story. And this will close our February podcast and show for word of mouth. Again, I'm your host, Michael Horn. I'm with Bobby Hoffman today, a young adult uh, in this uh, wonderful young adult community that we have in St. Louis. He has a lot of good insights for us to ponder through the month of February and uh, as we journey through Lent together. Just a reminder for you to find us uh, at the Archdiocese of St. Louis and to Make sure that you can rate and share us with your friends. Again, word of mouth. And it's just 
all about uh, sharing your evangelization story, sharing how Jesus has worked in your life, and just reaching out to others. Today we're talking about community, so God bless you as you journey through Lent, and may God just continue to grant us all the graces that we need to grow closer to Him. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.